everyone. Today I have with me author extraordinaire Kate Quinn. Thank you so much for talking to me today, Kate. Oh, thank you for having me. I love your book. <laughs> Clearly we're going to get along. <laughs> we're going to get along, exactly. I was so, I was kind of upset, and, and I almost postponed this for a minute because I didn't have your brand new book that is coming out, um, The Alice Network, which is, when is it coming out, this week? No, not this week. It's coming out on June 6th. Okay, so that's a little exactly bit Exactly one okay. month. <laughs> exactly. And is am I correct? Is today your birthday? No, it's not. I wonder if that was on some kind of social media notification. It was. Who it knows? Was. But no. Oh, <laughs> I am a Sagittarius baby, so it's not till the end of the year. <sighs> well, I'm kind of happy about that because I was like, I don't want to talk to you on your birthday like that. You should be out, you know, celebrating, so... Anyway, that's why I was like, I hope not. But anyway, um, are you? But you, the year was like, was it just a Sagittarius? Like December? Like um, it says you're 52, so it was like, is it just that, or is that like later this year that you turn 52? Oh, I, I turn. I I am actually at the very end of November, and I was born in '81. So, <gasps> are you kidding? Wow, there is maybe there's this other person out there. <laughs> I think he might, I think it might be the other profile that you're looking at. It's somebody oh. out there has the same name as me, and oh. um, I know oh, there's okay. at least one Kate Quinn online who sells organic designer baby clothes worn by uh, yeah, Tori Cruz, among that. others. <laughs> I did. I saw that. That's cool. I did see that one. But anyway, well, that's interesting. So anyway, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. But when I, okay, I'm a history buff, right? I love, I love historical fiction, but I wouldn't call this historical fiction because you weren't really, like, it's all real, right? I mean, that's not the genre that these are in, that your books are in. I call it historical fiction because everything is set in the past, and I am making creative leaps sometimes where there are gaps in history. So there is definitely fiction involved. I do try to work in as much real historical fact as is possible. But historical fiction, yes, is definitely what I call it. Okay. Well, I have uh, the book in front of me that I was going to show you was um, Lady of the Eternal City, and um, which is the latest of this series. But you're, you know, and then you have your brand new book, which isn't a part of any of these series, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, um, I I mean, okay, so I, I consider myself, I'm like a historical fiction buff, and I'm like, I know almost everything except for this era, okay? <laughs> this is crazy. And I was actually looking it up because you do such a nice way of, like, presenting it that I was looking, I had like this chart, like this family tree chart up, and so that I could like place these people, and I love how the personalities that you give them, and I was thinking when, as I'm reading this, the detail, and you keep so much real that I can't even imagine the research that goes into making these books, into writing these books, I should say. Always a huge amount. Uh, the reading really never stops. <laughs> and uh, I, the research really never stops either, but that's also the fun part. That's it. Yeah, I would imagine that this has to be such a passion of yours to dig for this the, for the information. And I'm sure it's easier now because of computers than, you know, it would have been 40 years ago. But, I mean, still, the way that you have to dig for any kind of information on these relationships and, you know, that kind of thing, especially with this era. So this era is back in the 100 in Rome. And I knew a little bit about Hadrian because of the Hadrian Wall. That yes, that's what place. everybody does to know when they associate with him. Right, exactly. So, I, you know, like my Roman knowledge was like as much as that. But, I mean, the, the rest of the story is just amazing. I, you know, I, I, I can't say enough about these books. And what I really wanted to share for everyone is that I think sometimes, like, you pick up a historical fiction book and you think, oh, I'm not going to know anything. I'm not going to know anything about that. That is just not my era. Well, that's what I thought when I started reading it. But it, it doesn't matter. You know, they were so good, and you did such a great job explaining every, you know, like just putting those details in there about where they are. And it's really um, it was so fascinating for me because it's not, you know, it was, it was awesome to learn about it. 
You know, so I felt like a student of this era. Well, I think historical fiction is one of the best ways to learn if you really want to come down to it. I wish history was taught in schools in a way that makes Mm -hmm. it entertaining because it is so wonderfully entertaining. So much of history is fascinating and it's weirder than real life. I mean, you can't make this stuff up because people would say you were crazy. But I think historical fiction at its best does that job. It, it, It educates people, but it doesn't make them feel like they're being educated. You're learning because you're interested. And ideally speaking, when you're plunked down into an era you know nothing about, Yes, Yes. some things about it are very strange. You know, the Colosseum is right around the corner where people are going to fight to the death right in front of you. And the fact that slavery is an empire-wide institution and the fact that, you know, you're ruled by an emperor and a senate and these bodies do not always get along and sometimes the blood spills out into the streets. I mean, these things are strange to us, but at the same time, the other way that historical fiction helps with readers is that it will remind them that people in the past were also people just like us. So even as you're looking at the things that are so different from our own world, ideally you're also looking at people in the past and seeing the ways that they are the same and the ways that their lives have similarities to ours. I think if you look at any situation where you see Roman ladies at the bathhouse, it's not that different from seeing ladies at a spa today. So that (laughs) common humanity will underscore the differences at the same time as you're learning something very, very strange and different about the past, you're also realizing how much we have in common. Yeah, and I did, you know, I, I've homeschooled my children, and so I've used historical fiction um, to help them, you know, learn different parts of history. And I have to say that I did well, that's try, wonderful. I did try the Roman Empire, okay, at one point. And I, every book that I went and got on it, like, I got so caught up in, like, wait a second, Caesar who, which Caesar, which, you know, like I I got lost. And this is the first time that I've read a book in that era that I am not lost, that I've read books (laughs) in that, you know, and I actually feel like I know them as people, you know, so you did such a great job with that. I just, I was like, I have to talk to her. I have to tell her how much I love these books. And, you know, I'm I'm really delighted. I'm not having to teach Roman history anymore, but that didn't stop me from reading them. (laughs) You know, but okay, but so tell me about the Alice Network so everybody understands where that, because I know that I read a little bit about it and I know that there's nowhere near this part of history. Yes, I was looking for something new and different in terms of era, in terms of subject, and I did happen to, you know, notice, as anyone would, if you study the trends, is that there is a lot of war fiction that is being very popular right now. And, you know, I love my job, and I love the Roman Empire, and I love Renaissance Italy, where I wrote two books. But I also like, you know, being able to pay bills. So (laughs) I do try to keep historical trends in mind. And I was seeing a lot of World War I and World War II fiction was selling. And these are eras that I have always been fascinated with. And so making the jump to think that I could write something in these eras, it's a little scary in the sense that you know there's a lot of research ahead, and there was. But at the Mm. same time, these are fascinating eras in their own right, and they bring their own challenges. And so I began reading everything I could find, just trying to find that historical hook that I could hang a story on. Mm -hmm. And so... I ended up finding a small squib about a spy network in World War I that was run by a French woman. She was hired by British intelligence, and she ran a network of spies in occupied France spying on the Germans. And this woman had such style and such flair and such intelligence and courage that I was captivated. And I ended up crafting a story about a woman who spies in her network on the Germans during World War I. And that story twines into another story that occurs in post-World War II, where you have the woman who was a spy in the first half, who is now a much older woman who is looking back at it, and who is still being pulled into a mystery that has its roots in her youth. And... I loved this story. It was a lot of research. It was a lot of work, but I love everything about it, and I love the idea that it's going to be out in a month, and I'll be able to share it with everyone. 
Yeah, I mean, when I went on your website today, um, I saw that you are you are starting a, a book tour, and for for this book, and you are going to be very close to me, and I'm going to come see you with this book. So that I just oh, get it wonderful. Time. Where are you located? I am in Pennsylvania, and you are going to be coming to Baltimore. I'm right above Philly. You're going to be coming to Baltimore, Maryland. I already have the date on my calendar for me not to schedule any interviews because I definitely want to come down there and because I want to read it and I want to come down there and see you and get it signed and you know and get a picture oh that's great and, you know. I can't wait to see you in person yeah but yeah I, I live in so. I live in Maryland so they're they were very oh. nice about setting me up in Washington DC for and uh, in Baltimore and in a couple of areas in the Maryland and DC area so I feel very lucky and then I'm also doing a number of other events around the Pacific Northwest because I'm going to the Historical Novel Society conference in Portland and I'll be hitting some areas around there as well while I'm there. <laughs> hmm. And I think that you know whenever I read a historical fiction novel I always think I mean you could so teach that it like the amount of research that goes into any one of these books is as much as what would take a professor to teach a class on this. I mean, I feel like you guys know so much, and I'm, I, I love when I, I'm on Facebook and I see um, there's different groups for historical fiction, and, you know, because that is my favorite for, you know, by far. I like reading history because I read a lot of books about history, but historical fiction is just totally different. It's a story. It's, you know, it's, it's – um, it's fantasy, but not, you know, it, it's all based on, and that's why I was saying when I was reading your book, I was like, wow, I really felt like I was there. I really felt like I'm not reading just a history book about Rome because I've tried to read those, you know, and if I, I anyone is out there, I have a lot of homeschooling moms who listen to this, and I, you know, urge you, if you are doing the Roman Empire, you know, to get these books and have your high school students read these because they are they are so amazing. Well, the nice thing about books is that I tend to think that it is, as I said, a way for people to learn, and it's what it really is is a jumping-off point. And a lot of historical authors will, and I'm one of them, will swear by the author's note in the end because that's where you have the opportunity to say exactly what it is that is really true and what it is that you fold in to make the story and what it is that you change. And there's all the things that you end up changing for the sake of the storyline. You try to do that as little as possible. But ideally speaking, what you're doing is writing something that will pique someone's interest. And so what they'll then do is go off and find more on their own. And that really is the best feeling in the world is thinking that not only did someone enjoy your story, but that they then went on and found other books about the same period. And what's wonderful about history is that it can give very different stories because I always think of Writing a historical novel is a bit like being Dr. Frankenstein. Uh, You have the historical (laughs) facts, which are a bit like having the skeleton. And it's your job with your story and with your prose and with the choices you make about the story and what what kind of story you want to tell, you're putting flesh on the bones. And if you ever want to see a great example of that, I have three friends who all wrote novels about the same historical figure, uh, and that figure is the one and only daughter of Cleopatra, you know, the famous Cleopatra. Her daughter was named Selene, and she was a captive of Rome, and then she went on to be queen of Mauritania. That is a pretty fascinating life, and she was a fascinating woman. And I have three friends who wrote historical novels about her, and all of those novels are different and fascinating and interesting, and they're all mm. great reading on their own right, even though they all crafted very different stories using the same set of facts. It would be just like seeing a skeleton that looks the same, you know, it's just a rack of bones, and then three different people who look completely different, but they're still just the same bones underneath. Right. So that's a great example of how you can use the same set of facts and still get completely different stories. And it's one thing I love about historical fiction is that, you can always find some new angle, something fresh, even if it's something that's been apparently done to death. Yeah, and I really think that everybody is so interested um, in TV shows, a TV series right now that is a historical fiction. Like, I got really into Queen Victoria, okay? And, <laughs> it's, it, you know, I just love, oh, my gosh, I just love that. I hope they do another season. But, you know, when I was reading these, I was like, this is such a TV series, 
you know, because like Vikings, like any of those, it's like, yeah, they're, they're real people, but you know they're filling in with different dialogue and things that they imagined that happened during that time. But you also learn so much about the people and that time, period. And it's, you know, people love learning about that. I, th- I think that those shows, and there's been many more, I mean, tons more. Those are the ones that I watch. But, I, you know, I really think that of this as a TV series. I could get so into this as a TV series. Let's put it that way. Well, I haven't had HBO make me any offers yet. I, you know, my fingers are always crossed, but not so well, far. But on I the other hand, so. um, ancient the ancient world is hard to do on a screen. I mean, there's that's a lot of costumed extras, and it's yeah. a lot of coliseum fights, and that's a lot of CGI to you know make the coliseum look like it's brand new and photoshopping yeah. all those framing thousands of people in togas. So I I understand why those are hard to make, but. I'm really encouraged by how many TV shows there are right now that are historically set. We have Victoria, we have Vikings, we have The Last Kingdom, which is based mm. on Werner Cornwell's Vikings mm-hmm. Saxon series. We have The Crown, which was hugely successful. Oh, yeah. We have Netflix, yep. Medici, Master, the uh, Medici Masters of Florence, which is wonderful, Italian Renaissance. We've got... Yeah. All kinds of things, you know, uh, Miss Fisher's Mysteries, which are, you know, lighthearted in the 20s, and we've got Peaky Blinders, you know, post-World War One crime family. So I'm really encouraged by how much great TV there is that's set in the past, because I think people want it. They just don't necessarily know that they want it. They think historical means inaccessible, and then, but what you really learn if you see it when it's done right, and hopefully read it when it's done right, is that it's not like having someone drone at you in a classroom. It's learning, but it's fun. And I really think that, like you said, um, you don't, you know, I think that it gets to a point when you're writing TV shows that um, the historical stuff, you, you're, it's better writing. It writes itself, you know, like it's still, like Queen Victoria wrote itself. It was an amazing show. And, you know, they, you don't have to make it up. It's like it happened. And it's just as interesting as anything that they could possibly make up, you know. That is always something I joke about with friends is that very often whenever I read a friend's rough draft, and a lot of us read each other's rough drafts because we're critique partners as well Mm -hmm. as uh, fellow authors, whenever I run across something that is just cuckoo nuts, (laughs) that is always when I know that has to be historically true because I know my friends, and I, and I know they wouldn't dare make up anything like that, because if you made up something that crazy, the readers would crucify you. <laughs> right. So when I read something crazy, I know it came out of real life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I, that's what I'm saying. I, you know, it's like the stuff just, you know, for the writers, I mean, how much fun is it as a screenwriter to write that stuff, you know, that's already there, and it's already, you know, they, they have such liberty with it, and it's, you know. Anyway, but, it, you know, I see this as theory. I hope someday somebody decides that it can be and, you know, and everybody will love oh, it. Oh, me too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right, so you, this has uh, interested me, is that you graduated from Boston, you, um, with gla- classical voice. So you're a singer, correct? Yes. I was okay. studying voice and studying opera specifically, and I loved to sing, but I was always writing books, and eventually the book writing just sort of took over and it was a couple years after I graduated that I ended up selling my first book which in fact I had written while I was in my freshman year because um, I was 18 and I had crossed the country 3,000 miles away from home and I knew no one and it was a Boston winter and I decided I would escape into ancient Rome so I was writing Mm. a book at the same time I was uh, getting to know my new surroundings and it wasn't the first book I'd written. I had a bunch of other novels I've been writing since I was 10, and they're all terrible, and no one will ever, ever, ever read them. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'll probably burn them to make sure I will never be blackmailed about how terrible they are. Aww. But that, that one I uh, wrote my freshman year stayed under the bed, but it wasn't too bad. And I kept rewriting it periodically, looking at it, trying to make it better. And when I was a couple years out of school, finally, I ended up getting an agent who liked it quite a lot, and she sold it some months later. Wow. Well, so you don't sing at all anymore? I do not. It's something I love. I love to sing, and I love opera. I always sing along with that, and I I say sing opera whenever I'm baking in particular. But (laughs) 
even if I loved the singing, I realized the lifestyle wasn't as much for me. I loved uh, to be a singer. It's a lot of auditioning. It's a lot of traveling. It's a lot of, you know, warming up in cold hallways, and it's a lot of sacrifice in, for family and so forth. And I wasn't sure that suited me as well as being a writer. So when my agent ended up selling my first book, um, mm. I ended up thinking that, all right, this is something I should try. And my husband being active duty Navy, it actually slotted in with his life rather well because it, the nice thing about being a writer is that I'm in business with a laptop and an internet connection wherever I go. Right. So right. with the fact that we end up moving every three years or so with a change of base means that it's not that not that much trouble for me to readjust. Right. Well, that's I lived on Andrews Air Force Base down there. Uh, my first ah. time was a Marine, <laughs> so I, I'm very familiar with that area also. But um, yes. Well, when I okay, so I signed up for your newsletter. And I got, you know, I got an instant newsletter and I started reading it. I was like, this is one of the best author newsletters I've ever written. I've read, ever read. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, I was like, you really, like a lot of them are just updates or, but you put a lot of work and a lot of thought into your newsletter. So I just want to tell everybody out there to go to your website and sign up for your newsletter because it is so much fun to read. And, you know, I think that nowadays, like emails, like people are like, oh, I don't want stuff in my email. I mean, I think about that. I really do. Like, I really try to censor what I get in my email because it becomes so, you know, logged down that I can't read it. But but this newsletter is worth getting for everybody out there. <laughs> <laughs> I will say it for those out there, my feature I do with every newsletter, and there are only four a year, so four emails a year. I promise I won't spam you. Is okay. I always live tweet a different historical event. So the last time around, it was um, I had a weatherman live tweeting the last day of Pompeii, and I have had, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. as you can see, that went well. And then I've had um, Odysseus live tweeting from inside the Trojan horse, and I've had Anne Boleyn live tweeting the first time Henry VIII hits on her. So. <gasps> I have fun with these. I try to make people laugh. Um, I don't see any point in being invited into someone's inbox, which is, you know, definitely a step for a lot of people when you have a lot of spam in the world nowadays. If you're going to yeah. invite me into your inbox, I'm going to make you laugh, or I'll do my best. I promise. Well, I am not that good on Twitter, but I'm going to go on. I mean, I, I post stuff on Twitter because, you know, by, by the social media standards, I kind of have to, but I really don't think I'm a very good Twitter person because I've never taken the time. But I'm going to go on there and follow you just so that I can see this stuff. I don't do a lot on Twitter, I have to admit. I'm on Facebook quite a bit more, but uh, Twitter I am a little bit baffled by, but I am there. I do I do try to keep up. <laughs> okay. Well, that's awesome. I'm so happy that I got to read your books. I'm so happy I came across them. I mean, it has, you know, I, I've, been, I've been telling everybody about you. I'm like, you want her book? I got her book. You want it? <laughs> if you don't want to order it, I'll give it to you. I have all three of them sitting right here, and um, I can't wait to, you know, pass them around and, um, I just I, I love your historical fiction and I I can't wait to read the Alice Network. I will I'm going to put a pre-order into Amazon right now for it and uh, just so I can come down and get it signed. Okay, great. Well, I am definitely going to look forward to meeting up in person and hopefully we can get a picture and have something to tweet. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so before I let you go, what is next? Like if the Alice Network is out there, I know you're writing something. Uh, that's out there, and then I'm looking at something else 20th century for the moment. Um, I've got another timeline that is another dual timeline. Actually, this one is three. It's triple, and it's a story about a hunt for war criminals after World War II and a real-life story that I found about a woman who was a Nazi who was found living as a housewife in Brooklyn, I think it was. And in her case, it was the 70s. I'm making mine a little bit earlier. But it was a total surprise to her husband and her neighbors, this entire <laughs> wartime past that she had. And a thread in there is also involving the Night Witch Squadron. And that was the name that was given to a regiment of all-female night bomber pilots that the Soviet Union was flying during World War II. 
and they were called the night witches because the Germans were terrified of them, and they said when these ladies were coming in on their planes in the dead of the night, they would cut their engines out and just glide down so there would be no sound when they came in and dropped their bombs. And the Germans on the ground said that it sounded like with the wind whistling over the wings of their planes, it sounded like a squadron of witches on their broomsticks flying overhead. <laughs> and I read that, and I thought, there is a story there, and I want wow. to Wow. That's odd. That, that sounds like a movie, okay? That sounds like a <laughs> it really movie. does. I can't believe there hasn't been much written about them, but there really hasn't been, so I'm delighted to be doing the research now. Well, and that's another thing is like with with you guys with the, you know, historical fiction is you find these stories and you bring them to life, you know, and they, it's like, you know, they kind of die off and then you find them somewhere and then you just bring it all and everybody's like, oh, my gosh, why wasn't, you know, why didn't we learn about that story? That's such an amazing story. So anyway, that's what that's I love awesome. about finding history, bits of history that you can shine a little bit of a spotlight on because there's so much history, and so often people only learn a little bit of it. You learn whatever is deemed important in school, which often focuses only on our own history and not on world history. Right. And a lot of the history we learn, either it doesn't stick with us or we it wasn't really taught in a very good way, so maybe it, you know, just did, it really didn't stick with us. And then a lot of the history just wasn't included to begin with. So, so often people will tell me, I can't believe I didn't know about this. How is there not movies and books? And how is it possible the world does not know about X or Y? And that's where I think historical fiction often fills the gap in, because there's so many fantastic stories that deserve to be told and deserve to be known, and often they aren't. So when you get a good historical novel, that's where it can pick up some of the slack. Yeah, well, I'm so happy that you're finding these stories, and I will continue to read your book, so you just keep writing, and I'll just keep reading, and <laughs> and I will put them out there on Facebook and everything. I'll have all your links attached to um, this video, and I will, you know, have pictures of your books, and, and I will see you soon. All right. I look forward to seeing you at my event in June. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Have a great night. Thank you so much for having me. 